Now this is the uh, third part in a series on the doctrine and the truth that Christians are the true Israel of God. I think it's going to be more than five parts, but uh, whatever, how many parts it ends up being, um, we can offer it as a set of CDs when we're all done, and then it's something that you have in package form when people don't understand uh, these truths, which so many do not. Uh, you have something that you can give them and sort of uh, bring them up to speed because it's so fundamental, uh, so fundamental that without an understanding of these things, it's pretty, you, you reach a stopping point in growing. You can't go any further. This is absolutely fundamentally necessary to growing in grace. Now, let me recap a little bit what we've covered so far, just a few minutes. Uh, first of all, we've made note that the believing Jew, along with the believing Gentile, together constitutes, uh, together they constitute the true Israel of God. And that particular specific belief is an old doctrine. It's not something new. It's not something that well, we've come up with. It is a Christian belief that can be traced back for 2,000 years, and the antiquity of that doctrine is cannot be held in dispute. It's there for anybody to see casually if they just, um, in a very light way, investigate that statement. It is there. It is part of our Christian testimony for 2,000 years. But in the last 100 years, everything's changed with Christian Zionism and uh, the oncoming of the Schofield Reference Bible and dispensationalism. But we need to go back further than 100 years. And when you do, I think a lot of people are surprised by what they find. Secondly, we've also discovered that the promise that was given to Abraham was given to Abraham and his seed, and that that seed, that singular seed, is Jesus Christ. So that the promises given to Abraham are fulfilled in Christ, and then lo and behold, those that are in Christ, and the only way you can be in Christ is by genuinely being born again by the Spirit of God, be you Jew or Gentile. Those that are in Christ are also Abraham's seed by virtue of their attachment to Christ. And in being, by being Abraham's seed, uh, Paul says, you are also the heirs of the promises that were given to Abraham. So we are the heirs of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And we are heirs by virtue of faith in Jesus Christ. It is a doctrine that is centered in the person of Jesus Christ. It is all about Jesus Christ, not about land, not about racial background. It's about what Christ did on Calvary. The promise give, given to Abraham is fulfilled in Calvary and in the resurrection of Christ, not in Zionism. That's an it. When you, when you say it's fulfilled in Zionism, that is contrary to the basic principles of the gospel that point us to the cross of Christ. We also um, looked at uh, the subject of the mystery of the gospel. And it's important that you understand what the mystery of the gospel is. And plainly put by the Apostle Paul, we found that the mystery of the gospel, that which was hidden in ages past, but has now been revealed. Uh, to us by his apostles. The mystery was that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs. Fellow heirs. They're heirs with somebody else. With who? Italians? Germans? Men? Women? No. Fellow heirs with the believing remnant amongst the Jews. See, God wouldn't break his promise to Abraham. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew, well, who are the ones he foreknew? The Jews that believe like Abraham would believe. The Jews that receive Christ as their Savior. And, now here's the mystery part, and then the Gentiles that receive Christ as their Savior would also be fellow heirs with the believing Jews. And then Paul says, and of the same body. So this idea that we've established a church and that's separate from uh, Abraham and the nation of Israel and the covenant made with Abraham. And we, we're, we're a church and that's Israel and they're two separate things. No. When we're born again into the kingdom of God, we are made fellow heirs and we're of the same body. God's nation. If you would, the Israel of God. And we enter into that status by faith. It's all about Jesus Christ. They want to throw stones at our doctrine, then, and they want to say that's not true. They have to detract 
from the importance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're saying Abraham was all about Christ. Moses, the promise given to David, all about Christ. Even the land promises, if we take time to get to it down the road, even the land promises Christ. It's all Jesus Christ. And uh, I don't know how a Christian can hold in contempt that kind of teaching. It doesn't make sense. Now, what I want to do today um, is review a little bit of our identity uh, in Christ as fellow heirs. Our actual identity, uh, the actual body that we as believers constitute. Can you put a label on it? And my answer is, yeah. We are the Israel of God, God's holy nation, his chosen people, the sons of Abraham. Now, we've already been going in that direction so far. We can go so much further with so many texts of Scripture. But I think when you ask Christians, who are we? Their knee-jerk reaction is, we're the church. See, you've got this thing, the church and Israel, completely different entities. They're not related. The church was a mystery born at Pentecost, unforeseen in the Old Testament. That's hogwash. You can't find any teaching like that in the Bible. The mystery was that we are fellow heirs and of the same body. But we do have to deal with this, this church thing. And so let's take a little bit of time, and then, uh, it, Lord willing, we have some more time. We'll tie it into Ephesians 2, which we just touched at the end of last week's lesson. And, and if we have some time, some other texts. But the church, see, now when you look in your Bible and you see that English word, uh, church, and I always like to say nobody knows what a church is. It, the word doesn't have a meaning other than what some minister says the word means. If I say rock, there's no theological meaning to the word rock. Or I suppose there's some applications of the word. You know, Christ is a rock upon which we're built. But everybody knows what a rock is. Or if I talk about a tree, everybody knows what a tree is. If I talk about an automobile, everybody knows what an automobile is. If I talk about a church, nobody knows what a church is. Unless someone's telling you, oh, it's this thing over here, or it's that thing over there. I don't know, is it the Roman Catholic Church, or is it the Presbyterian Church, or is it the Methodist Church? Who knows? Well, what's a church? The word has no meaning to us. But the Greek word that's translated church, and uh, uh, Tyndale was against the translating of the word ecclesia. That's the Greek word that's translated church. Every time you see the word church, the Greek word is ecclesia. Uh, Tyndale, William Tyndale, back in the days of the Reformation, was against translating the word church. And he wanted to put translate the word ecclesia, a congregation. Um, and that would have been better because now the, you, that has some sort of meaning. Congregation, they congregate. Now, when you look up, uh, if you go to your Strong's Concordance and you just do a little investigation of the word, it, it's broken down and you have two uh, uh, portions of it. Ek, which means out of, and kaleo, which means uh, to call. So it's ekklesia, it's to call out of. And if you look at the dictionary in the back of your Strong's Concordance, and you look up the word ecclesia, word translated church, the definition they give is assembly or church. Again, church, but church doesn't tell you anything. Assembly is saying something. There's a meaning to the word. And so it's most literal rendering, and no one will argue with me. I mean, you take a, even a dispensationalist, if, if he hears what I'm saying, when I say that the word that's translated church means literally a called out Assembly, a call out, call out congregation, uh, they won't argue with that. I mean, that's not in dispute at all. So, ecclesia is a called out assembly. It is an assembly of the people of God. And obviously, so when you say we are a called out assembly, even if you don't know what the word church means, and the priest tells you what a church is, the minister tells you what a church is, and somebody else tells you what a church is, but we all know what it means to be called out. And we all know what an assembly of people represents. There's nothing in dispute. So we're learning something about ourselves just by really understanding the word. And so if we are a call, the people of God are a called out assembly, it's, it, the, the meaning is right on the surface. What it means is that God has called us out. Obviously, God does the calling. So the very word, our identity, every dispensationalist will admit that we are an ecclesia. There's no one that's going to argue that. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that God has called us. God has called us out. Called us out of what? 
Well, very obviously, he's called us out of the world for a particular purpose. And if he's called us out, that means another way to say that is he's chosen us. He's chosen us out of the world, and we are an assembly, a gathering of people. It's not that he's choosing stones or trees. He's choosing people. Okay, And so there are a called out people of God that gather themselves together as an assembly before the Lord as his people, as his peculiar possession, and as his treasure. These are my people. I have called them out, and they now gather together before me as my people. They are a called out, chosen assembly. God's chosen people. You can't be saying somebody that is not the ecclesia and that does not belong to the ecclesia, that these people who are not part of the ecclesia are God's chosen people. That's, you realize how crazy that is? The ecclesia represents God's chosen people, those who have been called out by God to, be, to assemble themselves and congregate themselves together as his particular possession. The very word, that when we see the word church, the very word that undergirds it, the, the, the Greek word, it means God's chosen people. Um, in this book, Jerry Falwell and the Jews, written by a rabbi, Merrill Simon, and it's just all in the form of questions and answers. And the rabbi, <clears throat> rabbis are usually very learned men, doesn't mean everything they learn is true, but they've usually studied hard. Lots of people study hard and learn <laughs> bad things. But the rabbi is a learned man, and he asks, so he's writing, and this book is not meant for evangelical consumption. This is meant for Jewish consumption. This is not an evangelical book. This is a Jewish book written by a Jewish rabbi. The point of the book is that his uh, brethren, uh, the Jews, would read this and try to understand who Jerry Falwell is, uh, was from a Jewish perspective. And so it's all questions and answers. So the rabbi submitted the questions in writing, Jerry Falwell then had an opportunity to mull them over. They weren't rash responses on the spot, you know, with a microphone. But Jerry Falwell considered each question and responded in writing. That's how this book was made. And here's the question the rabbi asked. How do you reconcile the Christian notion of the church being the, quote, assembly of the elect, end quote, with the chosenness of the Jews? We read that again. How do you reconcile the Christian notion? Ah, the Christian notion. Glad to hear you say that. Because people throw stones at us because we say that. The rabbi knows what Christians are supposed to believe historically. The, uh, the rabbi says, how do you reconcile the Christian notion of the church being the assembly of the elect with the chosenness of the Jews? In other words, if you Christians are the assembly of the elect, the people that God has chosen, then what do you do with the Jews? How can we be the chosen ones if you're the chosen ones? That's the question. It's a, it's a absolutely practical question. The man knows what he's talking about. The rabbi has a full grasp of the facts. The rabbi has a grasp of the facts that a lot of Christian Protestant ministers don't have about themselves. It's kind of sad. And so the reason that he asked that question is because the rabbi understands that the word ecclesia means a called out assembly, or as he puts it, an assembly of the elect. Elect are people that have been chosen, people that God has called out. He's chosen them. So the rabbi understands ecclesia or church means God's chosen people, the assembly of the chosen ones, the assembly of the elect. That, that's the meaning of the word. How do you reconcile that idea that you guys are a church with the fact that we're supposed to be chosen. What, does God have two chosen people? What's going on with that? That's the, God, that's the rabbi's question. Good question. Which only goes to show that what I'm telling you about the meaning of this word, um, even the Jews understand. I shouldn't say even the Jews. Of course they would. Um, <laughs> Falwell, in my opinion, gave a very, very deceptive answer. And I say that because he was the chancellor of a university. And surely, even if he was no Greek scholar, he would have somewhere in his vast ministry took some time to study the word church. <laughs> sort of a fundamental thing. 
And uh, Fowell's answer is, now to my knowledge, nowhere is the church ever referred to as the assembly of the elect. So I don't have to answer your question. We don't consider ourselves the assembly of the elect. Nowhere does the Bible ever teach that the church is the assembly of the elect. And it's true. You can't go to the Bible and see the church is the assembly of the elect. And the reason you can't find that stated anywhere is because the word church means that. that would, there's no need to say that. That's why the rabbi is asking the question. So it's a deceptive answer. Uh, as if to say, well, it never says that. But Jerry Falwell, I can't believe he doesn't know ecclesia means the assembly of the elect. And the rabbi is happy to hear him play the dumbed-down routine and like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. We've never called ourselves the assembly of the elect. And the rabbi, oh, okay, you're going to go that way? Well, we'll go with that. So we're the elect, right? And Jerry Fowler would basically say, yes, yeah, we're just a church, but you are the chosen ones. Now, the rabbi knows that Jerry Fowler is backpedaling and denying himself. He's denying his own identification. He knows that, and he's happy for him to do it. It's a good question. So that's our identity. Uh, we are the assembly of the elect, God's chosen people. Now turn to Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> and this term, the assembly of the elect, the ecclesia, what uh, most call the church, the term is specifically applied. Now they say the church was born at Pentecost, right? The church was a mystery in Old Testament times, unforeseen by the prophets, but now it's been revealed. In the Old Testament, you had Old Testament Israel, and now since the day of Pentecost, you have, we're told, a church, a brand new institution separate from Israel, they say. And so Israel is Israel, the church is the church, and they're completely separate things. And there was no church before Pentecost, but that's not true. Because the Old Testament Jews as a nation, were called a church. More specifically, more accurately, they were called the Ecclesia. The Old Testament nation of Israel was referred to as the Ecclesia, the called out assembly. If that's true, it couldn't have been born at Pentecost. Well, it is true, and it's spelled out right here in Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your own brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Christ would come on the scene, even as Israel of old had to yield to Moses. Israel in the future would have to yield to Christ, the Messiah. This is he, speaking of Moses, this is he that was in the church now, if you go and look up that word church in your strong concordance, it's ecclesia, which they say didn't come to be till Pentecost. Not true. And they say the church is not Israel. Yes, it is. In fact, even shockingly to their minds, Old Testament Israel. This is he, verse 38, that was in the ecclesia, the called out assembly, in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him, in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now, the historical, uh, the historical context uh, that he's referring to is what Chris read to you earlier. That's why I had him read that. We're not really so much going to teach from uh, Exodus chapter 19, although we'll go there for a little bit. But uh, that's the, the historical reference being made. So the Jews are at Mount Sinai. They've gotten out of uh, they've been uh, delivered from Egyptian bondage. They come to Mount Sinai in Horeb, and now they are to receive the commandments of God. They are to receive their covenant, the terms of their covenant, and they have to have a face-to-face -face meeting with God. God is now going to call his people to himself. That gathering is referred to in the New Testament as the ecclesia. There's no denying it. There's no denying it. It's easy to look up the word. Now, there's a great meaning to that. There's, there's depth to that, having that knowledge and believing this truth. And I, I want you to see that. Let's go back to Exodus 19. 
and make sure we get the benefit of what's, what's being said here. Exodus chapter 19 and well for instance in verse 5 now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant which he is to give them in chapter 20 the Ten Commandments though for the terms of the covenant and of course there are other laws that will come along as well the, some of the ceremonial aspects and uh, the dietary laws and different things like that but the heart and soul of the law of Moses is the Ten Commandments. That's, that establishes them. And the Lord will write that in stone himself. Uh, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. These words belong to the children of Israel. You are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now then the Lord tells them to sanctify themselves for that day because the Lord wants to meet with them on, at the mount. And they're going to meet their God face to face and he is going to give them the terms of their covenant as the, the people of God under the Old Testament. Look at verse 10. For the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day, Day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about. Now he says no one's going to touch the mountain that I dwell on or they'll die. If a beast touches the mountain, he will die. You are to keep your distance. The ground is holy. I'm holy. You're unclean. But I'm calling you. I'm going to give you a covenant. I'm going to give you the terms of the covenant. And of course, the, the children of Israel, once he gave the covenant, we read it earlier, they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. In other words, we will obey you, we will be your people, you will be our God, and we will keep the terms of the covenant. And they swore to do that. We read that earlier. And so the Lord comes down, there was uh, lightning and thunders, the earth shook, smoke filled the mountain, the people were scared to death. Don't let the Lord, they would say to Moses, don't let the Lord speak to us. We'll die if we hear his voice. That's how guilty they felt as sinners. You can't enter into the presence, the genuine presence of a holy God, and then feel, feel positive about yourself. You can lie to your mother, to your father, to your children, and pretend I'm a pretty decent person. I don't have sin. And you can fool everybody. You can't fool God. And when God shows up on the scene, all the lying and the excuses come to an end. Well, that's what happened, and um, they met with the Lord, and the Lord said, you gather them together, and you have them come to the base of the mount, and I'll reveal myself to them. And, uh, of course, then in verse 20, I had Chris read the first three verses just to show you this was in conjunction with the giving of the Ten Commandments, and uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So they're coming to receive their covenant. They're t coming to meet with God as the people of God. God commanded that they gather themselves together uh, to meet with him, that he might establish them and secure them as his people by giving them the, the terms of their covenant. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And this is after, his, uh, chronologically, this is after that. And Moses is remembering this day, all of Exodus 19 into 20, was the day that God's people met with God on the mount and gathered themselves together as his people and received their covenant. And uh, here in Deuteronomy 4, Moses is remembering that day, and it's really interesting. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 10. Uh, well, back up verse 9, a little context. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. Unless they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Now, the assembling of Israel at Sinai 
which is described in detail in Exodus 19 and 20, which we read earlier uh, before the sermon. Uh, Chris read it for us. We just skimmed through it now. Uh, the assembling of the children of Israel at Horeb, at the foot of Sinai, was not just a, a bunch of people getting together. <laughs> no, it was more than that. It was the elect of God, the ones chosen by God, Abraham's seed, to be his people, and God called them together that they would assemble themselves before him and meet with him as his people as he established them, establishes them firmly in their covenant by giving to them the terms of the covenant. It's a huge day in the history of Israel. Now, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, but before Christ came on the scene, um, there was a Greek version of the Old Testament that was produced by the rabbis called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation by rabbis before the days of Christ of the Old Testament. And I want you to, in this uh, Deuteronomy 4.10, um, if you look at how it's written in the Septuagint, you find something interesting. For instance, in verse 10, uh, the Lord says, Gather me the people together. In the King James, he says, Gather me the people together. In the Septuagint, it's ecclesi ecclesia and then S O N attached to ecclesia, ecclesia son. Pros me, meaning assemble to me the people. So the Lord in the Septuagint is saying, Assemble, ecclesia, ecclesia the people, if you would, ecclesia the people before me. Assemble the people before me. And then in the King James, we read, Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. That's the King James. Especially, you want to teach your children, but especially remind them of the day that, that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. In the Septuagint, it reads this way. The day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. And then this phrase is added, in the day of the assembly. That's how it reads in the Septuagint, written by rabbis before Christ came in the scene. scene. In the day of the assembly, uh, Hemeretes Ecclesias. In the day of the assembly. The word Ecclesia is not found in the Septuagint Greek Old Testament until that passage. And it refers to Old Testament Israel, and God commanded them to be an ecclesia before them and to gather themselves together as his chosen ones to meet with their God as he gives them uh, the terms of their covenant. And Moses would refer to that day in subsequent passages as the day of the assembly. Now, people assemble all the time. The children of Israel assembled for a lot of different reasons. If God blow a trumpet, and the enemy is over there, we better get together and they would assemble. There's lots of assembly. But there is the assembly. The assembly of the children of Old Testament Israel in the Old Testament. I mean, Moses talks about the assembly, the ecclesia in the Septuagint. When Moses talks about the assembly, he was referring to that day at Sinai in Horeb. Let me show you the examples of that. Turn to Deuteronomy 9. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 9. And verse 10. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone. Moses is recounting this. The Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. The day, how can there be the assembly? Again, that's how important this day was. Now, obviously, here in our King James, when we read the day of the assembly, we're, that's coming from a Hebrew word. So the ecclesia is a Greek word. So there's no ecclesia in the uh, uh, the Masoretic text which undergirds the Old Testament. That's Hebrew. But in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, written by Jewish rabbis before Christ, it's the Ecclesia, the day of the assembly. And you see the English translation from the Hebrew matches that anyway. We're, we're driven in that direction even without that knowledge. It's the day of the assembly when the people of God who are under covenant status with him assembled themselves together by his command and met with him. 
And in fact, the Lord uh, told them to assemble themselves together, and it was ecclesia, see? And here it's referred to as the day of the assembly. In Deuteronomy uh, 10 and verse 4, Again, recounting the past, and he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. The Philistines would assemble themselves many times. That doesn't matter. The day of the assembly refers to God's people meeting face to face with their God as he dispenses to them the terms of the covenant he, was, he has made with them as his people, as his called out assembly. And that was the day of the assembly. Give you one more, Deuteronomy chapter 18. And verse 15, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Well, that was the passage we read, quoted from the New Testament. And uh, verse 16, according to all that thou desirest, of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly. In the day of the assembly. So Moses referred to God's people uh, being called out and gathered together before the Lord to meet with him as his people. He referred to that day at Sinai as the day of the assembly and is consistently applied that way. That singular day of all days with the assembly of God's people. And that uh, designation was given to them at Sinai when they received the law and their covenant. Now you think about that. Is it a coincidence that we are called the ecclesia? It just means you know, people say, well, we're a church. What's that got to do with this? See, that's the, that's the danger of the word church. It doesn't mean anything to anyone. You can't make the connections. It's a faceless word. Now you go back to the word and read it, and then you find it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The children in Acts, in Acts 7, that's what we're looking at. Uh, the, the assembly, the church in the wilderness at Horeb at Sinai. That's what it says in Acts chapter 7. The ecclesia, the called out assembly that gathered themselves as the people of God before him at Horeb. And we're called that. We are called the assembly. We are called the ecclesia. And it's the word if used in the exact same way that it was applied to Israel in the Old Testament. For we are, as Christians, Jews and Gentiles, in Christ, we are the called out, covenantal people of God. We're in covenant status with God. The only distinction now being we're not under the Old Covenant, we're under the New Covenant. But we are the called out, chosen, um, covenantal people of God who have gathered themselves together and we congregate ourselves as the people that God has chosen before him. We are the ecclesia. Just like Old Testament Israel. In fact, the word is so strong in the connection between Old and New Covenant uh, Israel. Uh, the word is so strong that the word ecclesia even applies to religious assemblies of Jews in the lifetime of Christ. Now remember, the, the dispensationalists tell us that the church was born at Pentecost. So before Pentecost, there's no church, which is refuted from Acts 7, quite obviously. We've been talking about that. But when Christ was alive, it was technically Old Testament days. Right? That's why the Lord, the Lord would still keep the law of Moses, because he wasn't living under the New Covenant. The New Covenant is ratified when he sheds his blood. Now, he hasn't shed his blood yet. So while Christ is living and walking on the earth, he's living under the law of Moses, and he's living in Old Testament times. And in those Old Testament times, during the lifetime of Christ, when the Jews came together and assembled themselves, the, still being the people of God, still, still Old Covenant times. Oh, and I, I know not all Israel is Israel, but they were still the people of God. That covenant was still outstanding. When they gathered themselves together, they were referred to as an assembly. 
Now, I'll give you one example of that. Turn to Matthew 18. So it's not just the assembly in the wilderness way back at Sinai. Even in the lifetime of Christ, they were an assembly. Acts chapter 18. And verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Now this is Jesus speaking about how they should conduct themselves. He has not died in the cross yet. He's, a, he's exhorting Old Testament saints, if you would. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them... Tell it unto the church. Tell it unto the uh, uh, ecclesia is the word. Tell it unto the called out assembly. But if he neglect to hear the assembly, uh, let him be unto thee as an heathen. Now, actually, it's not. It's synagogue. That's the, the actual Greek word, synagogue. And if you look up the word synagogue, and this is the definition that it gives, an assemblage of persons. See, not ecclesia, synagogue. Make sure I get that right. An assemblage of persons, specifically a Jewish synagogue. Now that makes sense because Jesus is speaking to Old Testament Jews. And he says, when you gather yourself together, uh, this is how you to operate. If, so, if you have a brother that offends you, this is what you need to do. But if he won't listen to these multiple exhortations, tell it to the synagogue. Um, in the definition we read, an assemblage of persons, synagogue is the Greek word, synagogue, the, the English word, uh, an assemblage of persons, specifically a Jewish synagogue, by analogy, a Christian church. Then colon, and then it gives three translations of this synagogue. And the first one it gives is assembly. The second word it gives is congregation. This is in your Strong's. And the third word it gives is synagogue. So we, uh, the, the, the Jews were a synagogue. They were an assembly. They were a congregation. But that shouldn't surprise us because there was the ecclesia in the wilderness, the call-out assembly at Mount, at, at Mount Sinai. And the Jews, when they gathered themselves still as the people of God under that old covenant, they were an assembly as too. And so that's why I've said to you in the past, in a very real sense, we represent the synagogue of God as opposed to the synagogue of Satan. Things have sort of turned over in a way a lot of people can't fathom or handle. And so we see the, the idea that we are an ecclesia is screaming out to us our connection to the people of God. We are the rightful heirs of the promises given to Abraham because we walk in the faith of Abraham. And in our number, we have Jewish believers who acknowledged Christ. So God was cap faithful to keep his promise to Abraham to call out a remnant of his seed. And he still continues to do so. But then added to their number, and this was the mystery of the gospel, was that the Gentiles would be brought in and be fellow heirs, partakers of the same body. They would join their true synagogues. They would become the assembly of the elect. And the assembly of the elect that gathered themselves in the wilderness. And when we look at Moses there, gathered together, and, and Joshua is there, we can legitimately say they are our forefathers. And we have more of a right to lay claim to be the descendants of Abraham than any Jewish fella in the Old Testament who did not walk in faith. One thing to say, I have the blood of Abraham. It's another thing to say, I have the faith of Abraham. And the Bible is telling us which one is more important. And modern day theology flips it around. Now, there's a wonderful point. Well, I can't make that point now. Turn to Ephesians 2. I'd like to make this next point in conjunction with everything I've said while it's fresh in your mind. But I won't have the time to develop it. So let's instead go to Ephesians 2. And we can round out our thoughts this way. Now, the end of last week's lesson, we just touched the capstone uh, uh, verses, the book, the book ends, the, the beginning and the ending. And uh, 
Maybe just a few minutes we can cover this more fully and give it a little bit more of what it deserves. In Ephesians chapter 2, uh, don't, re- don't forget, in Ephesians 3, right across the column, well, at least it's across the column in my Bible, um, in, in, in chapter 3, we're told what the mystery of the gospel is, and the definition of the mystery of the gospel is right there in verse 6. Verse 6 of chapter 3, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. That means that they're heirs with somebody else. And obviously, that's the descendants from Abraham that walk by faith. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. There was a body of God's people that already existed. What body was that? (laughs) The ecclesia found in the wilderness, thank you. The called out assembly, God's chosen people. They also went by the name of Israel. And in that passage we read, we found out that they were a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. That body has been in existence since God called out Abraham, and particularly since the giving of the law and establishing them in the land. That body already existed. They were the people of God. Guess what? We're now partakers of the same body. We didn't go off uh, into the outer stratosphere and start some new thing called the church. Okay, we can understand a kingdom, we can understand a nation, we can understand the covenant God made with Abraham, but then we're just sort of some uh, disembodied, vague entity floating around. We're a church. We're God's second best. And when he's done with us, he's going to go back to the Jews and give them a kingdom for a thousand years. It's not what the Bible teaches. That's to almost turn from the flesh and go to the Spirit and embrace Christ and then the Lord's going to go back to the flesh. That's not how it's going to, to, to pan out. The Bible doesn't teach that. Once you, you turn from Moses and go to Christ, there's no going back. There's no going back. For the true people of God, there's no going back. Now in Ephesians 2, this, this mystery of the gospel that the Gentiles who believe in Christ would be fellow heirs and of the same body with the believing Jews... That's spelled out so specifically here in chapter 2, verse 12. Well, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye, you Gentiles, who were the uncircumcision, At that time, verse 12, ye were without Christ in Old Testament days. The Gentiles, the uncircumcised, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The Gentiles did not belong to the commonwealth of Israel. And we're told that they were strangers from the covenants of promise. The Gentiles did not have a covenant with God. They were not in the the, the covenant, they were not in the commonwealth of Israel, and they were strangers from the covenants of promise. Those covenants of promise were given to Abraham and his seed. Having, as Gentiles under the Old Testament, having no hope and without God in the world. So it's a pretty sad picture of the Gentiles in Old Testament days. But did God abandon them thoroughly and totally and forever? That was never God's plan to do that. But now, verse 13, but now, see, there's something changing. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, you Gentiles who were not part of the commonwealth of Israel, you were far off from it, you had no promise. Ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh, made nigh to what? The subject is the commonwealth of Israel. Made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both, Jew and Gentile, one. He hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us. Well, if he's made both one, how did he do that? By making a brand new entity called the church? No. Because we were fellow heirs with the believing Jews and partakers of the same body. The ecclesia in the wilderness that existed then and now exists in an even greater form now. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, of two, one new man, 
This idea, God has two people. The Jews are his earthly people, and the church is his spiritual or heavenly people. That's not true. The Bible time and again says specifically that's not true. He makes of the two one new man, so making peace. Dispensationalism creates division. That's why the rabbi has to ask Jerry Falwell, how can you be the assembly of the elect if we as Jews are the assembly of the elect? See, there's a problem. But if you believe the truth, there's no division. The only thing I'd say to the rabbi, well, you know, if you believe like Abraham, you'd have all your hopes and dreams and the promises, you, you get to participate in them too. God hasn't forsaken you. You forsook, you forsook him. And the benefit for us as Gentile believers is we get to be grafted into the, uh, the Jewish remnant that was faithful to God and believed on Christ and did like David would have done. That's all we're saying. So God continues to bless his people, but he gets to add others in. Are you going to despise the fact that God is going to be kind to others? Just because you want to so make it a racial thing? That's what the Pharisees did. And modern day dispensationalism is a subtle form of Pharisaism in making those claims. So in verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off. See? You were afar off. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. And you were far off, but now have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. And finally, verse 19, Now therefore, you Gentiles who were not a people at one time, and, uh, and, you, and you were uh, uh, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, now therefore, verse 19, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, with the saints, the believing remnant amongst the Jews, and of the household of God. You were one time aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now you're fellow citizens. You're no longer strangers to that. You're not the, I say this all the time. You're not the citizen of a church. It doesn't make sense. You're the citizen of a nation. You can be the citizen of a commonwealth. And that's our identity. We are citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. The ecclesia in the wilderness. And so it is today. And the benefit now, the Lord has purged out the unbelievers from his people Israel and the true Israel of God the true ecclesia is now made up only of those by faith we don't have to worry about the flesh and circumcision and people being born into our body it's by faith the Lord has purged his people and that's a good thing let's bow our heads in prayer Heavenly Father we thank thee for the blessings of this truth it uplifts our souls it makes us realize the continuity we have to the saints of old and the unity of the scriptures, even of the old and the new covenants, in that every word written on every page of the Bible was meant to point us to Jesus Christ, the true seed of Abraham, in whom we receive our blessings. And we pray this all in Jesus' name.